and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about Anton Wilhelm Amo and race in early modern philosophy with Justin E. H. Smith, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Paris. Hi, Justin. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on the podcast. We are going to be talking not only about Amo, but also about themes in your book, uh, which you published a few years ago, an amazing book, which I really liked, called Nature, Human Nature, and Human Difference, Race in Early Modern Philosophy. But perhaps we should also just mention briefly that you, together with Stephen Men, are working on a kind of intellectual biography and translation of Amo. Is that right? That's right. It's a critical edition and translation of two of his treatises, the two philosophical dissertations of 1734 on mind and body, together with a very long biographical introduction. Okay, great. But let's start by sort of setting the scene for Amo. Uh, Mm -hmm. One of the disputes you talk about in that earlier book is one that unfolded in early modern Europe between two ideas really about where humans come from or how races evolve. Mm -hmm. One is called monogenesis, the other theory is called polygenesis. Can you explain this contrast and say something about how these two views were supported by their adherents? Sure. Well, the the very short definition of these two views is that monogenesis is the theory according to which all human beings are descended from the same uh, first uh, parents, and polygenesis is the view that either there are uh, different sets of first parents for different groups of people, or uh, at least potentially, there are some people, or maybe what appear to be people, but in fact are something ontologically quite distinct, who were born of the earth, or emerged out of mud and slime spontaneously in some way or other. Now, it should be noted that at least in the 17th and 18th centuries, Far and away, the default position, uh, the um, uh, mainstream view, is monogenesis. That is to say that in part because very few people in the 17th and 18th centuries were able to overtly contradict the uh, account of human origins given in Scripture, in the book of Genesis, Almost every mainstream thinker in the 17th and 18th centuries, at least uh, in, let's say, uh, ri- written or published work, uh, came out in favor of the view that all human groups, however different they appear, however different the cultures are or their geographical region is, descend from Adam and Eve. The only people who are polygenesists um, uh, in the era are what you might call uh, radical thinkers, libertines, and this in particular in the 16th century, in the Renaissance, and uh, most of all in Italy. Uh, names like Lucilio Vanini, and although he's somewhat more cagey on the question, Giordano Bruno are associated with the theory of polygenesis. What Vanini says is that uh, 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 the Native Americans, and this is middle of the 16th century, so what he knows about the, let's say, the lived reality of Native Americans in Italy in the 1550s or thereabouts is very, very minimal. Um, So it's more, I take it, a sort of thought experiment to propose that somewhere uh, in the far corner of the world, recently discovered to us, it is possible that what appear to be people there, in fact, emerged out of the earth and are not descended from Adam and Eve. This is a variety of polygenesis, and it's also, of course, associated with the theory of giants, which is common uh, throughout a number of different authors who are not writing explicitly on the question of polygenesis. For example, in the early 18th century, in Giambattista Vico, what is a giant? It is someone who is literally gigantes, right, which is the Latinization of the Greek word for 
born of the earth or born out of the earth. So thinking about giants as the libertine polygenesists were inclined to do uh, was a way of, I think, opening the door to a naturalistic interpretation of the origins of human beings, but doing it, doing it in a way that is at the same time, in hindsight, grossly racist, right? Because it's effectively saying, we're descended from Adam and Eve, those folks over there far away are born of mud and slime. Now, of course, we're all born of mud and slime. Um, and so which direction you want to you want to take this in is, uh, is, is, is an interesting question, I think, but it's the sort of thing that you really have to understand in its historical context. Wouldn't there be an implication that the on the polygenesis theory that the Native Americans, let's say, would not be subject to original sin if sin comes down to us from Adam and Eve? Uh, certainly, though, of course, there's also in some authors the implication that a simulacrum of a human being is something that couldn't just be spontaneously generated out of the earth, but must also uh, be um, something for whose production uh, the devil has some responsibility, uh, and so and so there's sin there, but in a in a different in a different. Uh, sense than uh, than our own original sin and our own fall, and then there are of course other theories such as, for example, Isaac La uh the so-called pre-Adamite theory, according to which there were several different uh, atoms, um, and that you know La Perere wants to find scriptural justification for this view, and in this case, if this were correct, the implication would be that Native Americans have their own atom, presumably Sub-Saharan Africans have their own atom. Now, this is the middle of the 17th century, and this is also a kind of radical position to take up. Uh, it's less interesting to me than uh, what Vanini and Bruno are toying with a hundred years earlier. Um, but in this case, you certainly wouldn't uh, be able to get around uh, original sin uh, because, you know, they're also uh, equally human beings, just human beings who have a different, uh, different set of first parents on the pre on the pre-Adamite view. Another point you make in your book is that certain philosophers, because of their metaphysical presuppositions, may sort of be inclined to certain views about race. And one of the kind of leitmotifs of the book is that people who are dualists, like Amo, so who think that the mind and the body are fundamentally different kinds of things, mm -hmm. may have a certain perspective on race, mm -hmm. and that it might even lead them to think that race just makes no fundamental moral difference at all. Can sure. you kind of explain why that would be? Well, I think I mean, one thing is one motivation for for pursuing this line of thought is just that dualism gets such a bad rap today. I think uh, we're all so kind of uh, uh, knee jerk opposed to the thought of it. Uh, and we transmit this to our students in intro to philosophy courses, whereas I think a pretty strong case can be made that the uh, naturalization of the human being uh, over the course of the modern period goes hand in hand historically with the rise of theories of human inequality. Um, and if you think about it for just a second, the connection is obvious, right? If a human being is nothing but a soul, and if the body is only contingently connected to what actually makes the human being what they are, then no outer marker of bodily difference is going to be plausibly taken as relevant for placing any indiv individual human being within a hierarchy of better and worse, right? And I think actually have very strong evidence that the implications, the racial implications of anti-dualism are something that were on people's minds uh, consciously and explicitly in the early modern period. I can just give you one example. Gabriel Daniel, 
who was a Jesuit priest, a French Jesuit at the end of the 17th century, who wrote a hilarious satire of Descartes' metaphysics and published it in 1690. It's called uh, Le Voyage du Monde de Descartes. Uh, he gives this scenario where there's an African servant who uh, learns the secret of ambulation of the soul, how to make the soul leave the body and go wandering around. He learns this from the Cartesian sort of sect uh, that keeps the secret because they enjoy going soul walking at night like witches. Um, when the African learns this, he starts doing this. And one day his soul is out wandering and his body is sleeping under a tree and uh, a mob of people comes along and effectively lynches him because they believe he has raped a young woman. His body is left there, killed by the mob, and his soul uh, is left to wander and can't, can't die because it can't go back into a body that dies, right? So um, eventually Descartes dies too, and Descartes is a dualist, and so he encounters the soul of this African, and there's a long scene where they go to the moon, and on the moon they encounter the souls of the other dead philosophers like Aristotle and Plato, and the other philosophers shun Descartes because Descartes has a friend who is an African, or uh, Descartes' soul has a friend who is an African soul. Let me put it that way. And and the 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 kind of the joke in all of this, Daniel's joke, is that Descartes is the only philosopher who would make friends with the soul of an African because he is a dualist and therefore doesn't care what race the body of the formerly living African was, right? So if that's not, I think, a pretty knockdown proof that this connection between anti-dualism and the rise of, let's say, a uh, an explicitly racialized theory of human inequality was not on people's minds in the early modern period. I don't know what is. That's incredible. And actually, can I just point out a little irony there, which is that uh, there's something that we discussed in an earlier episode when we were talking about pre-colonial African traditional ideas about the soul, mm -hmm. which is that there's anthropological and eth ethnographic reports about uh, African peoples who believe that the soul can leave the body, right? And there's sure. been arguments in contemporary African philosophy scholarship mm -hmm. about whether this commits them to a Cartesian theory of soul. Right. It's amazing right. to hear that there's an early modern text pointing out right. that a car is sort of going the other way, like this is an African character learning <laughs> from Descartes right. about the idea right. of soul walking. Right, 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 right. Right. I mean, it's hard to say what Daniel's uh, sources for this were, but presumably just kind of widespread folk ideas about uh, witchcraft and kind of peasant uh, sorcery of the sort that, you know, the scholars like Carlo Ginsberg have nicely brought back to life for us. But let me just add one more thing about the connection between naturalization of human beings and the rise of racism. Uh, the other smoking gun, if you will, I think think is in the early 18th century in the work of Linnaeus, right, where you have a kind of double movement that Linnaeus um, effects in uh, the system of nature. One is to go against the tradition of earlier systems of nature and to include homo as uh, something that is solidly within the order of nature, and that is to say next to, Homo now figures next to the various other, what Linnaeus called anthropomorpha, which is to say the great apes. So that's one motion. And then the other parallel motion within Linnaeus is to include further subdivisions of Homo, like Homo afer, that is the African man, Homo europaeus, Homo Asiaticus, Homo Americanus, and so on. So you see, the idea is that once you have a naturalized human being, there is, the way I see it, no obstacle to continuing with the further naturalization of even finer-grained differences within humankind, right? And uh, 
that's the the history of the rise of scientific racism right now of course whether scientific racism must be present in order for there to be racism is another big question that i'm not going to address unless you make me <laughs> no i won't make you <laughs> so don't worry uh before we get on to talking about amo i just wanted to ask you about one other figure just because mm -hmm. he plays such a big role in your book and this is leibniz who yeah from 1646 to 1716 Mm -hmm. I, I had to write that down, by the way. I didn't have it memorized. <laughs> what were Leibniz's views on race? And actually, how did they relate to his views on the philosophy of mind, which is what we've just been discussing? Okay. It's a very complicated question. And I have sometimes thought that in that book, I might have portrayed Leibniz in too positive a light because I am just kind of such a Leibnizian and have been for so long. I, I, I read him charitably. Um, and there has been some criticism and indeed some shock and horror at an early text that Leibniz wrote in which he, uh, this is really bad. I mean, he basically says that he would like to see a European uh, colonial power conquer the island of Madagascar and bring groups of uh, boys not older than 12 years old to be segregated into their respective nations or linguistic communities and trained up as great warrior slaves who could then conquer the world. Not a very good start <laughs> to Leibniz's, <laughs> Leibniz's career of thinking about human difference. Both evil I, and impractical. <laughs> right. Well, so uh, as with everything, I put this in context and I, I think I kind of fleshed out what was actually going on here. One thing that he was doing was trying to make a case that France should follow Spain's example in the conquest of the Canary Islands between 100 and 200 years prior. Um, and using the Canary Islands as a sort of jumping off point for the conquest of, of, of the Americas. Uh, and it was like directly from that example. But the other thing that I think is really important for understanding the way 17th century German authors and even early 18th century German authors, including, by the way, Amo, the way these authors wrote about and thought about slavery was by and large, not on the example of the transatlantic uh, slave trade. It, it was on the example of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and they saw the Ottoman institutions of slavery as the modern world's living descendant of ancient slavery, of ancient Roman slavery. And they were particularly interested authors like Leibniz, but also Tomasius, and also uh, Jacobus Capitain, the, the Ghanaian author in Amsterdam in the early 18th century, they were particularly interested in the institution of the Janissaries, who were, strictly speaking, slaves, right? They were kidnapped um, under orders of the sultan and brought back to uh, the sultan's palace, whether they wanted to go or not, as little boys. But then they were trained up in a kind of core of like elite bodyguards. And, you know, they were kind of, in a certain respect, the heroes of the nation. So the term slave in this German context is very, very, let's say, much in need of being fleshed out according to what the preoccupations uh, in, the, in the time and place were. And they were different in Germany at the time than they were in France and England and to some extent in the Netherlands. And this is in part for geographical and economic reasons. So Leibniz um, doesn't make a good first impression if you're looking for his earliest writings about, um, about human diversity, let's say. I think that Leibniz indeed is a dualist of a very particular sort, and I'm not going to give you the full kind of elaboration of the way the body um, flows from the perceptual activity of incorporeal monads. We can skip all of that, but suffice it to say that the basic metaphysical commitment that Leibniz has is that at bottom, every perceiving subject, 
which is to say really everything that actually exists, including but not limited to all human beings, is in the end, in a certain respect, identical to every other and is differentiated only according to point of view uh, on the order of coexistence of uh, other substances. That's Leibniz's basic metaphysical commitment. And I think this translates into his theory of human diversity and human equality in a very interesting way. And I think we can see this in particular in his new essays concerning human understanding, which is a 1704 response to John Locke's essay concerning human understanding of 1690. Uh, Locke is already dead when Leibniz um, comes out with this work in 1704, but it's basically um, an attempt to deal with basically every aspect of Locke's empiricist philosophy that Leibniz does not like. Now, uh, there's a part in which Leibniz is responding to something that Locke had said about a rumor, or let's say something he had heard travelers from Africa say that in Africa, Locke believes there are women who have offspring with apes. And this is like a proto King Kong sort of thing. The apes come and ravage the women. Um, and so there are all these ape human hybrids in Africa, Locke thinks. Are they human beings or not? Well, here you get the theory of um, uh, nominal versus real essences. Locke thinks ultimately uh, nature is not going to dictate the answer to that question. It's up to us to, to decide whether they should count as human beings or not. Right? Now, Leibniz comes back and says uh, many interesting things taking off from this question about you know, what it is to be a human being um, and about whether there are outward signs in the body or perhaps in the conduct of the body that can reveal whether what we're dealing with is a human being or not. And he says, not necessarily, right? He thinks that, you know, there's no kind of cutoff point for amount of amount of body hair or uh, perhaps a little stub of a tail or something like that, at which point you would say, sorry, not a human being any longer. Now, in this discussion, he's not primarily interested in the question of ape-human hybrids. He's not primarily interested in the question of lower races as his contemporaries might have seen them. What he is interested in is what we today would think of as disability. Uh, that is cases in which um, people are born, human beings are born without the capacity to convey to those around them that there is an inhering faculty of reason in there. Right. Uh, but in such cases, it is nevertheless for Leibniz a threshold matter whether we're dealing with a human being or not. And uh, the threshold is something that need not be empirically uh, discernible or not, but it is something that gives us, that dictates uh, an absolute yes or no to the question, is this a human being or not, right? So this is something that that interests Leibniz in the context mostly as concerns um, disability or developmental uh, impediments to what we think of as normal for a human being, but it also extends uh, or is extensible to a general theory of human equality. Turning then now to Amo, uh, we talked about him in the last episode, but can you remind the listeners about what works we have from him and how they interrelate or build on each other? Uh, sure. There are three extant works. There is a possible fourth that I'll get back to soon enough. There are two uh, philosophical dissertations on mind and body, both written in 1734. Uh, the first is uh, what we commonly refer to as the apatheia, or also the impassivity. The full title is On the Impassivity of the Human Mind, and it's, a let's say, a defense of a radical dualism uh, that goes beyond Descartes to the extent that it, it excludes the possibility of what Descartes would have called passions of the soul. And the other is one that had sometimes been mistakenly attributed to someone named Mina, 
And the reason is that Mina was the person who defended this dissertation under Amo's supervision. And in the 1730s in German universities, it was quite common when you go to defend a thesis that you're not defending your own thesis, you're defending your uh, your superior's thesis. <laughs> Why would you have your own thesis if you're just a student? Um, and so there are several references in the in this work in um, uh, the title is very long, but we call it sometimes the concrete idea. Uh, the fuller title is a dissertation containing a distinction of the, con the concrete idea of the, the mind and that of the uh, living organic body or something like that. I'm forgetting the title. I've translated it, but it's too long to remember. And uh, there are several references in there to uh, my uh, apatheia, which are, I think, a knockdown argument that the author is the person who wrote the apatheia, which is to say, amo. Now, uh, there are references in these works to another work that is not complete and that is called the Tractatus de Arte Sobria uh, et Accurate Philosophandi, the, the treatise on the art of soberly and accurately philosophizing, which uh, comes out in 1738, four years later. It is much, much longer. It's about, uh, about 200 pages, uh, and it's a treatise of logic, which is a very curious, very original work uh, on many diverse topics, uh, including hermeneutics, but also syllogism and other more traditional things. Uh, so those are the three known treatises of Amo. There might be a fourth, but I'm inclined to doubt it, uh, uh, a 1729 legal dissertation uh, called De Jure Maurorum in Europa on the right of Moors in Europe. Um, why do I doubt that it exists and we just haven't found it? Well, in part for reasons that I've already explained. It's quite likely that when they say that he defended this thesis in the legal faculty in 1729, what this means is that there was an event uh, where Amo spoke uh, but there may not necessarily be a written text based on that, either a transcript or a treatise that he had written in advance. It could just be uh, that the only written work that ever existed were the summaries and announcements that we do have. And how far do you think the description we have about the argument he put forth in that takes us in understanding what he actually argued? I mean, even assuming it was a verbal presentation, do you think we know what he said? I think we do, yes, and I think um, uh, it's largely thanks to this remarkable publication uh, that helps us a lot to make sense of Amos' context called the Wöchentliche Hallische Anzeigen, so the you know the weekly the weekly Halle news, bulletin, um, maybe. yeah, the bulletin, which um, which tells us everything that was going on. I mean, it tells us, you know, every musical instrument that was for sale in the musical instrument store on which, on such and such street in Halle. And it also tells us what classes were being offered in the law faculty and summarizes the lectures. And we know that Amo's advisor, a, a fellow by the name of von Ludewig, that's with an E in the middle, Ludwig, during the semester that Amo defended that dissertation, or that thesis, I should say, was lecturing, von Ludwig was lecturing on Justinian law and on the so-called enfiefment of African kings under Justinian law, which is to say that it seems that because Germany was you know, uh, basically under uh, Roman law, and they conceived of this as continuous with the Codex Justinianus from late antiquity, um, what Justinian spelled out as to the status of um, sovereign African kings still held in Germany today, right, in the early 18th century, which is remarkable. And what we learn from the Codex Justinianus is that the idea seems to be that once 
the African kings were enfeefed, this meant that they had a kind of sovereign status alongside any other noble who might be traveling in Europe. And this makes me think in turn, makes us think, I think, you know, I've talked to Stephen Mann a lot about this a lot, and we've consulted um, law historians um, who know a lot more about this than we do, that Amo was almost certainly the son of an African noble. And he was likely in Europe as a representative of an important family, right? Now, how much weight this had, how much, how much kind of carte blanche this gave him for entry into various social circles he moved in, we don't know. But it seems quite likely that when he's talking about the status of Africans in Europe, he has in mind a particular class of Africans. That's really interesting because one of the things we mentioned in our episode is that there was this kind of proposal that uh, because Amo came from an Akan background mm -hmm. yeah, um, in what is now Ghana, mm -hmm. there might be some kind of uh, distinctively Akan or African ideas mm. floating around that might have pushed him towards dualism or whatever. And yeah. I think you're, you're skeptical about that. And we are also kind of skeptical about it because he moved there so young. But actually, yeah. what you're saying there implies that his particular background in Africa maybe did have mm -hmm. an impact on the way he thought about actually this issue of slavery. Well, one thing, one thing that we have discovered, and I still haven't seen the document, I have to go to the Netherlands State Archives to, to, to really, you know, uh, nail this down. But I've seen enough evidence to be morally certain that in uh, late 1746, Amo wrote to uh, and it, the Dutch West Indies Company from Jena, he wrote to Amsterdam requesting passage on a D Dutch West Indies ship back to Africa. And by early 1747, that's what happened. We don't know how he got from Vienna to Amsterdam. There are a lot of a lot of gaps here, but uh, that's how he got back to Africa. If this is the case, then even though he had been in Germany for 40 years, it seems likely that um, that the administrators at the Dutch West Indies Company knew who he was. Right. You know, so this is an African in Europe requesting passage on a slave ship. Um, back to Africa, right? So that's one one bit of evidence that throughout his life in Germany, he has some kind of continuing connection to a network of people with connections in Africa. Another thing is that there is a Swiss traveler who gives us a report from the early 1750s about his meeting with Amo once Amo is back in West Africa. And the Swiss traveler tells us this is remarkable that he's met the most incredible man who speaks high and low Dutch, as he puts it. He speaks French and Latin and Greek and Hebrew, and he is currently making his living as a soothsayer. So this means, and we don't, I don't know who he, whose fortunes he was telling, but likely he was telling the fortunes of, um, local Africans of the same ethnic group he came from, which means that he probably kind of still had the idiom, right? He still knew how to talk to people. Um, and that is a pretty strong piece of evidence that throughout his years in Germany, he was not unaware of who he was. That said, I do not find a single trace of evidence in any of his written works that he's putting his own history, his own identity or reflections thereupon out there uh, for the world to read. I just don't see it. Um, I, I think, think that, I mean, you, you talk in the book about how his dualism kind of responds to various uh, threads of his German context, right? Yeah. I think I am not entirely satisfied with what I say in my Amo chapter of that 2015 book, and that's in part why, um, why I'm still working on him. 
<laughs> because uh, uh, when I finished that book, I had only recently started reading and thinking about Amo, and there were a lot of holes I still needed to fill in, in particular about the the context in Hala. And I think that at the time I took uh, uh, Amo to have been in a in a camp at the University of Hala that was on the other side of an ideological divide from figures like Georg Ernst Stahl, whom I took to be conservatives of a certain sort. And I think the picture of Halle in the 1730s is much murkier than that. There was the opposition between the pietists and the Enlightenment-oriented Wolfians, but at the same time, it was the pietists who were so gung-ho about what we would call, using the historical term, Orientalism. That is to say, learning about uh, cultures beyond Europe, and in this broad sense, uh, West Africa is included within the Orient, partially for missionary reasons, but also partially for pure intellectual reasons. So Hala became a, a center, a pietist center of, let's say, uh, early proto-anthropological curiosity. So I'm not convinced that Amo was on the opposite side from um, these people I depicted uh, in the 2015 book as his as his foes. <laughs> okay. So research continuing there on Amo. Exactly. And for the full yeah. story, we'll have to wait for your book with Stephen about him. Yeah. Um, but before we uh, wrap up, uh, I just wanted to ask you to sketch some of the other things you say in your earlier book about what happened after Amo. So he died in the yeah. middle of the 18th century. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't really see the full fruition of more naturalist approaches to human nature. But mm -hmm. those naturalist ideas are going to provide a context for a lot of what we're going to be looking at in future yeah. episodes, because we're going to be yeah. looking at the 18th and 19th century. So what, just like very briefly, what, what sort of things happen there? And how does naturalism affect ideas about race? Well, I, I think I've already uh, alluded to that somewhat in the example of uh, Linnaeus. Um, but just again, my broad historical thesis is that um, you can't have scientific racism before you have a global conceptual scheme that places all human beings within a taxonomy that also includes non-human beings, that is, uh, plants and animals in particular. And this really only gets going over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. So in that respect, I take scientific racism to be a, a direct side effect of the naturalization of human beings. Now, does this mean that we should not have naturalized human beings and we should have gone on thinking that... Um, Human beings are half god, half brute, uh, and that and that it's the it's the immaterial eternal soul that makes us what we are, and not not any connection we appear to have to animals. No, I'm glad I'm glad naturalism came along. I'm glad we have evolutionary accounts of how, as we put it earlier, at the end of the day, we're all born of mud and slime. That is to say, we're all evolved from single-celled organisms. That's fine with me. Um, but I do think that it means that we're being too simplistic when we think that dualism is a primary culprit in the history of racism. And also, we're uh, being offered here in this example that I've just given a really kind of vivid case study and an important case study of the way in which science um, can and in its history, in fact, does give us a complex mixture of truth and at the same time, new opportunities for ideological distortion of that truth, right? And that's how I see the history of scientific racism. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for that uh, very wide-ranging and erudite overview of uh, Amo and his context. We're actually yeah. going to be moving on now to look at more literature of the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, mm -hmm. especially in English, so turning away mm -hmm. from these Latin works written in Germany to uh, things written in the language we're actually speaking right now. Yeah. So thanks very much, first of all, to Justin Smith for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks. It was a pleasure.
and please join Chike and me as we start looking at early Africana writing in English next time here on the History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell him I had heart trials